In a world where the middle finger was a cool gesture, I was now making prayer hands in front of my heart several times a day. And I like the shift in my energy. This is the Jai Sugar Method. We train to master our own mind. Hello, everyone. Today, I want to share some stories from a fascinating time in my life. I had a seven-year run with the vegan diet from the beginning of 2009 to the spring of 2016. This episode of the podcast is not intended to bash or encourage a vegan lifestyle, but will instead illustrate a few key points about this very personal choice. Today, I will talk about five aspects of my vegan journey. First, I will share my psychology as a vegan and why I initiated the practice. I will also share the gains I made as a vegan, which were incredible. I will then expose the limitations and flaws of a vegan diet. Then I will share why I returned to being a healthy omnivore. Lastly, I will share what I typically eat like now in 2021 and why it works for this current stage of my life. Despite parting ways with veganism, I have no regrets about my time as a vegan. Looking back, these were some of the most interesting and fun years of my life. So let's dive right in. Let's look at my mindset entering the vegan practice and where this story begins. You see, the story starts at Jiva Mukti Yoga School in 2009. At the start of 2009, two and through the beginning of 2016, this period was a buildup I built up to veganism, and then I ramped down. It was a slow pull away from the practice. The seven-year period I'm going to talk to you about characterized the devotional aspect of the practice where I was a strict plant-based eater. You see, I had been flirting with yoga for about nine years, doing three or four classes a week to complement my intense heavy lifting at the gym and my road running in Central Park. I was super athletic and worked out constantly, and for me, up to this point, yoga didn't take over my life. It was a supplemental practice to keep me healthy and prevent injury. When I stumbled upon Jiva Mukti Yoga School, it was a time in my life where I was looking for a deep, deep transformation. Jiva Mukti Yoga School, New York City, the 2009 Union Square iteration of the school. Imagine a spaceship from the Pleiades, 11th dimension Pleiadians landing, and the kids bending spoons with their minds and levitating their toys above their right hand as you walk through. It's got this really unique, magnificent, stellar energy in the heart of the city, immersed in illusion or Maya or sand castles in the sky. Everyone is pursuing something that is temporary and deeply attached to these pursuits. But at the school, we're real true mystics exploring the heart of reality. So it had a fascinating energy, rock star teachers, supermodels, celebrities. To be there was to shift out of the nightclub energy into a spiritual atmosphere. We call it the Bhav or the divine mood. It's just short of church where there's something holy, clean, meaningful, deeply, deeply spiritual and engaging, but something you can never really put your finger on as an outsider. And I yearned to be on the inside and to be in this identity and part of Jiva Mukti, to live liberated while, li- while in the body, to be a Jivan Mukta was an aspiration of mine after practicing so many times at the school. My experience at the school was very, very deep because I had grown up with my grandfather reading the Bhagavad Gita to me. I had grown up in a house with worship to the same mantras. Uh, in the home and hearing them again as an adult who had had a little bit of life experience, loss and the pursuit of pleasure that is meaningless, I was looking for meaning and this school was connecting to my cultural roots 
the deepest yearnings for spirit seemed to be embedded in the practice that the school was presenting and teaching every single day. You see, before I started my daily practice at Jiva Mukti, I had been suffering from loss. My younger brother had died many years before, and I had tried many, many things to heal. I had run three marathons. I had been to every nightclub all over the world and partied my face off. I had various addictions. Nothing could quench my thirst or answer my questions as to where he went and why good people die young. I was perplexed, not healed, and incomplete and searching and yearning for a deeper reality. When I walked into Jivamukti Yoga, it was the first place that combined the philosophy and spiritual dimension to yoga with the physical asana practice. I remember getting back from a six-week trip to India, a very powerful trip. And what blew me away about this trip to India was the level of satisfaction even the poorest people had in their eyes, a level of gratitude for life, a sense of happiness. You see, even people living on the side of the road in a tent, not knowing where their next meal would come from, would smile. They were happy. They were grateful for the little that they had. And this caused me to really question the meaning of life back home in New York City. I was a coach to very, very successful people who were extremely miserable. I myself had built a very powerful career and had a lot of success in all of my endeavors, but felt like something was missing. Something was underneath the surface that I hadn't yet scratched. And after this trip from India, I went into the bathroom one day in my apartment near the Upper West Side outside of Central Park, and I looked in the mirror and I engaged my own eyes. I know it sounds a little weird to look at yourself in the mirror, but I wasn't looking at powerful attributes like symmetry and a jawline. I was staring into my eyes deeply. I was looking at my character. And I was looking to see if I could be happy and accept my life as it was. I stared back at my own eyes for a whole hour and kept realizing how many things I had added to my being, how many layers upon layers were additions so that I could feel accepted, whole, and like I had arrived and made it. I saw all of the muscle on my body. I saw hair down to my shoulders. I saw a long list of lovers, conquests. I saw pairing the success of others to my success by association. I was a coach to the most excellent, the leaders across multiple fields. All of these additions and many more added ego, self-aggrandizement, puffing one's chest up. And I started to wonder as I looked deeper and deeper for longer and longer into my own eyes, I said to myself, geez, I wonder, I wonder what it would be like to remove things, to scrub clean, to drop some of these additions and layers. And so the teachings at Jivamukti Yoga School started to become more consistent, more stable. The practice always pulled me back because of the dharma, the eternal teachings that were connected to the vinyasa krama, the breathing practice, the even breathing practice that built a natural concentration. And in this natural concentration, the true nature of reality was reflected. I started to peel back and understand yoga philosophy in a way that could be applied to my own life. I saw my own selfishness. I saw my own ignorance. I saw the ways I would stumble over my own feet and sometimes hurt others unintentionally. And I wanted to bring more consciousness into my life. So on that day, when I looked at my eyes in the mirror, I literally 
left the bathroom, grabbed my coat, and walked over to the Equinox gym, canceled my membership, and then I floated downtown to Union Square, walked into Jiva Mukti, bought a daily membership, and the transition started. I committed to a daily practice that would get deeper and deeper and deeper and more and more devotional. You see, I wanted to change. I was coping. I was seeking. One day in Pashimottanasana, the seated forward bend, I folded forward and cried tears of joy as I went inside of myself. I had never had an experience of that. I was not a guy who cried. I was raised by a big, strong military man, a sergeant in the army. And here I was, a grown adult in the heart of New York City with tears of compassion and joy flowing out of my eyes. And I knew a transformation was underway. I also had a girlfriend who was a vegan, and this can play no small part in that shift because a lifestyle shift is more of a layup and less of a challenge when your partner is already on the path that you wish to tread. So here I was becoming devoted to yoga. I had a girlfriend who was vegan. I was practicing every day, at least once a day, and many times two or three times a day, up to five hours of practice. And I made the jump upon the suggestion of my teacher, Sharon Gannon and David Life, that veganism is connected to yogic and spiritual depth. Granted, I was highly suggestible, but I knew that I would take to this practice all the way, no matter what. You see, yama is restraint or self-control. And veganism got me in touch with the energy of restraint and not allowing my senses to always take me for a ride. Once I listened to the teaching of Sharon Gannon and David Life and wanted to embody more compassion for all living beings, this idea of self-control and mastery of ahimsa, nonviolence, was what made this decision final. So there I was, I committed to the practice fully at Jiva Mukti Yoga School, which was connected to the vegan practice. And under the guidance of my teachers, I started to learn how to eat a vegan diet. One of the key teachings at Jiva Mukti Yoga School was the teaching of ahimsa or nonviolence. And this, eating a vegan diet and sparing the life of factory farmed animals, was a way of expressing a deep level of ahimsa, one of the cornerstones of yogic practice. This was thought to make the mind peaceful, and by making the mind peaceful and putting it in a tranquil groove, one would more likely realize their own spirit. So I felt that this was true. Once I started to learn about factory farms, I surrendered my attachment to meat eating and it became easier to transition to veganism. So the why, the why is totally connected to absolute depth, and I linked restraining my diet and changing my diet to deeper spiritual insights, which made and fortified the commitment to the path of yoga and veganism. Now, let's explore some of the gains I made as a vegan. Again, remember, I'm not bitter about my time as a vegan because I gained so many positive transformations from the process. So the first thing I want to share is I became an amazing cook during those seven years. For me, before this, cooking was always practical, but as a New Yorker, you eat out on the go so much that you get used to that process. As a vegan, you have to do your best to make your own food because you can control the variables of what is on that plate in proportion to balancing your blood sugar. I learned a lot about healthy vegetarianism by studying the macrobiotics of Michio Kushi. 
I went to the Cushy Institute in Lenox, Massachusetts to educate myself about gut flora and healthy vegetarianism. So my plate always had a grain, a green, and a bean with a side of miso soup for gut health. Macrobiotics is the healthiest way I find to do veganism because of its sense of balancing the plate and keeping the blood sugar stable. They also focus on healthy, complex carbohydrates, which control the spiking and lowering of blood sugar. If you become susceptible to simple carbs and sugar and caffeine, a lot of caffeine, it sucks your energy. And I don't wish this for anyone. It is very unhealthy to be addicted to simple carbohydrates, sugar, and caffeine. So, again, cooking and plating food became a hobby and an art for me during this period of time. And it's a skill that I've taken further since not being a vegan anymore. Another gain I made as a vegan is prayer and mantra became a daily part of my life. It gave me a sacredness and a reverence for life. Devotion and discipline had become second nature to me and were strengthened by the energy of sacrifice that veganism offers. I was given a devotional action. In a world where the middle finger was a cool gesture, I was now making prayer hands in front of my heart several times a day. And I liked the shift in my energy. I retained these practices to this day. Veganism also made me peaceful and deeply concerned about all living beings. I became more compassionate for others, especially those outside of my immediate circle. I was a guy that always felt unconditional love for other beings, but now it got granular. I literally lost my taste for meat when I started to learn more about factory farms and the horrible, mean, cruel conditions that animals that are raised for food live under. This compassion helped me with the energy of sacrifice until the taste was eradicated for meat from my mouth. Another gain I made from veganism is that I completely mastered asanas, the physical yoga posture practice, because I had changed my body into a yogic body. It had become light, strong, supple, and stable. It was like a lion. It was compact like a large jungle cat like a tiger, like a jaguar. It was nimble and lean. And I really enjoyed moving in the ways that I could not prior to having yoga and veganism under my belt. There's also the idea of the nadis, the subtle energy channels. They're supposed to be, depends on your lineage or tradition, up to 350,000 energy channels where subtle energy or prana, chi, or life force flows. The main three channels yogis are connected with are the pingala nadi on the right side and the ida nadi on the left side. The pingala is the masculine channel and the ida is the feminine channel. The shashumna nadi is the central channel through which we want these two energies to converge And when they intersect at various vortexes, they form what we call the chakras. So I was getting in touch with energy under my body that I had never felt before. And I clearly connect this to the sacrificial way of eating that a vegan eats. It's very simple. It's very pure. It digests very quickly. And since one is studying the movement of energy, you tap into the subtle energy under the body. I literally achieved a full transformation. I had reshaped my identity and my body, and this proved to me as an adult that I could do anything I wanted to. You see, while I was a kid in high school, I I transformed into a runner. I became a basketball player. In college, I became a weightlifter. These small transformations were again reinforcing that idea that I could do anything I applied my mind to. But this one, going all the way and mastering asana, 
and pursuing a deep interest that was in my mind and heart and getting granular with it. I embraced this idea that I was a guy that would go all the way in to the deepest level to study anything I was interested in. So it brought me to a deep truth about myself and, an, and accepting a part of myself that is intense. I embraced my intensity and my devotion. And in this way, I created a bit of confidence, inner confidence, inner self-reliance. I had developed mental strength. My time as a vegan was an opportunity for me to step into another world. You see, I was outside of yoga as a big weightlifter and a runner. I was outside looking in. When I drank the Kool-Aid, became a vegan, and started to practice every day at Jiva Mukti Yoga School, I was in the thick of it. I was in the center of it. I had gotten the backstage pass. I was with the people that we would call New York City mystics. I had cracked into their world on the inside. And I was glad for this transformation. It provided a lot of insight and learning that changed my life path forever. I'd like to now talk to you about the limitations of a vegan diet. This is in no way to dissuade you from trying it if it's on your mind. I will add that I have a very strong background in the natural sciences with deep understanding of digestion and assimilation. There are very few out there who can convert plant matter into the nutrients that are needed for a human body. I've met two individuals in my life who were vegan from childhood, since they were little babies, into adulthood, well into their 30s, who were very healthy and stable individuals, but only two. Our brain is a very fatty organ and needs animal fat to maintain itself. When the brain starves, you'll find we lose our sense of humor. The nerves are protected by a myelin sheath. And this is an insulation of fat around a wire that conducts electricity. So we need fat to maintain the brain and good brain function. A vegetarian or a vegan can get this fat, but animal fat is particularly useful to the brain and very efficient to the brain. We also need vitamin D, which is found in fish products. It has cholesterol, and cholesterol in our skin converts sunlight into vitamin D. Vitamin K2 is found in animal products. K2 helps calcium deposit in the bones and the teeth. Without it, calcium creates stones in the kidney and the liver. Calcium can also be leached from your bones on a vegan diet. This was a really interesting realization for me because I've had healthy teeth my whole life. As a vegan, I had problems with my teeth and weakness in my bones. My malnourishment lasted longer because my people, Indians, fare well on a vegetarian diet. They're adjusted to it. K2 can be found in one vegetarian food called natto, which is fermented soybeans uh, with a special uh, bacteria in it that makes K2. Now, you can get a lot of the things you need in a vegan diet from supplements, but imagine how natural is it to have a radical regimen of supplements every day. Also, vegetarians will be missing zinc, and that is involved in enzymatic re reactions. A lot of physical and mental degeneration can happen when you are practicing veganism. I recommend studying two authors the first is by Lier Keith, called The Vegetarian Myth. That's a great book. And also, Vegetarianism Explained by Natasha Campbell McBride is an excellent resource for those looking to come off of veganism. Veganism also makes the mind very yin. The minimalism of it all is attractive for a spiritual aspirant. 
you expand all the way out into the universe when you eat a simple diet. You do become one with the cosmos. You are on a different frequency. But one must also learn to contain that knowledge in a yang, a contracted container, which is why I often teach a little bit of strength training to people practicing daily yoga with me. When we are totally yin or expanded, the practice can become just a new mass that we use to elevate our status in the social hierarchy. When we contain that knowledge in a yang, contracted container of stability and strength, and we make the sp spine and bone strong, we are relatable and inspiring to our local community and our families. Some will be set up for mental diseases and instability if they stay very long on the vegan diet. So why did I return to being a healthy omnivore? You see, I started to research the opposite of the vegan diet because I had a health crisis in the start of 2014. I was suffering from a serious disease called leishmaniasis. I had been bitten by an insect in the jungle that caused a flesh-eating protozoa to replicate in my blood and cause lesions on my body. I had a huge hole on my left shin that kept getting bigger month by month by month. And I was suffering with this disease for a full year and my doctors came to me and said, we're going to treat you with an experimental drug that can kill this thing. Seven doctors came by me, my room in the hospital and said, we highly recommend you eat some animal food to heal and close this wound. I had lost my taste completely from starting the drug treatment. The drug was called sodium stibogluconate or pentostam, and it taxed the liver, but it was a risk I was willing to take because I knew it was the only drug out there that could stamp out this crazy flesh-eating disease that I had contracted from my time in the jungle. So my girlfriend at the time agreed to help me by making eggs and salmon every day, a little bit of eggs and salmon and I would force it down. I would have to flood it in hot sauce just to stomach the taste of the food. But the doctors were right. On the very last day of the six weeks of infusion in my blood and six hours a day at the hospital, on the last day, I took off the bandage from my left shin and flicked the scab that had closed the wound and sealed my skin, which was exposed for a full year. This was deeply revealing to me. I started to think, wow, I was descended from warriors. I'm from the warrior class. These people always ate meat because meat helps you with a positive type of aggression. My body is constituted from meat. And so I started to research deeply the opposite and the science of veganism versus the healthy omnivore. There was a cognitive dissonance in my mind. What I found was more and more research supporting my ancestral lineage and the way I constituted my body. I started to realize at this time that veganism was a diet of renunciation. It was a diet of distancing oneself from the world, and it was a diet of full enlightenment. And if you are going for full enlightenment, it literally means that this is your last lifetime in a human body, and you are saying goodbye to coming back in future human bodies karmically. Now, this practice takes hours and hours and hours of contemplation every day, uninterrupted, for decades of one's life. Serious, serious meditation. This was not weaving spirituality into one's life. And I started to become very realistic about this lifetime I was in was one where I would only be able to work out a fistful of karmas from my previous births. I started to see that my path was to be in the world and to serve the world. And in order to do that service, I had to eat the most stabilizing food. 
So for a few years, there was a cognitive dissonance where I knew it would be right to start eating meat, but I couldn't bring myself to do it because I didn't want to disappoint my teachers and the community that I was a part of. I also had lost my taste for meat. Until in 2016, in the spring, I traveled to Atlanta for a business conference, and I had a deep craving for meat. Now, what was beautiful about this is I did not have my yogi friends around me, and I followed my impulses and made a reservation to the best steakhouse in town, and I ordered a huge steak, a huge fatty steak. And while I was eating the steak, I felt a tinge of guilt, but I could not stop eating it. My body sucked it up and absorbed every ounce of that protein. I had visions of my colon being backed up and stuck with undigested meat, but it became the opposite process as I started to absorb those nutrients. And I felt a rejuvenation of my brain and my body. I felt strong. And on that day, I slowly started the process of integration, of integrating animal food into my diet slowly, slowly until I learned how to balance it and arrive at the place that I am today. You see, researching the opposite beyond the dogma led me to the following ideas. The notion that we are not what we eat, we are what we can absorb. Plant food is a place where bacteria nest in the fiber, the good and the bad bacteria that help us with the flora and our immune system. They nest in the fiber. Fibers help to cleanse. Plants help to cleanse. I realized that my Indian genetics made me last longer and withstand the malnutrition that most cultures can't stand for too long. I also realized that veganism reduces your production of the sex hormones because the base of these hormones are cholesterol. And this is why spiritual aspirants are drawn to vegetarianism and veganism because the sexual energy is the most distracting of all energies when one is pursuing spirituality. So spiritual people and religious people use this diet for their mental goals, their perceptual goals. Again, it's a diet of renouncing the world. And if you want to have a family, you probably won't work well with veganism. I also learned that veganism will not necessarily save the planet. While I agree that factory farming is cruel and toxic on all levels, I found that natural animal husbandry and farming is great for the environment. Industrial agriculture is bad and disturbs the soil. They literally kill the earth. But natural, sustainable farming is the way to go, and we should do our best to support these practices. I also realize that a high-carbohydrate diet will lead most people to serious illnesses. I learned that veganism clings to non-harming, but, 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 there is no life without death. There's a cycle that is constantly going on in nature. You see, ecosystems are millions of years old. Soil has millions of microorganisms. Soil is fed nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You feed the soil with blood, bones, and manure from animals. You see, for plants to live, animals have to die. And for animals to live, plants have to die. It's an old, old, old symbiotic process. So I chose to support sustainable farming practices. I want to now share what I eat like today in 2021 and why it works for my current stage of life. I basically practice intermittent fasting. What I learned from veganism is that we don't need 
as much food as we constantly take in. You see, the Western world is like a conveyor belt of food all around us, and we are mostly overfed and undernourished. So the practice I do now is intermittent fasting. I'll have a high-fat coffee or tea in the morning, and I'll try to eat my first meal at 1.30 p.m. and my second meal at 5.30 or 6.30 p.m. So I'm eating in a very short window all of my food for the day and asking the energy of digestion to churn hard only for a portion of the day. In this way, I'm getting a net energy gain rather than an energy loss. Most people are suffering from an energy loss because the cost of breaking down their food is greater than the yield of energy the food provides, which is why they rely so much on stimulants like two, three, four, or five cups of coffee or soda to get through the day. I make a dish that I really enjoy called farm curry, which has local ground beef. I use that dish. It's so strong. I only need that meat dish once a week. If I go out, I'll occasionally have a steak. I have chickens on my farm and I eat fresh eggs daily from the chickens. I also enjoy sardines and I like to use ghee in my cooking, my soups, and even I blend that in with my coffee. Brown rice is a staple in my diet because it's great, complex carbohydrate that digests at a reasonable pace. The husk of the brown rice slows down the digestion. It's not as simple and spiking the blood sugar as high as when one eats white rice. So brown rice is in my diet almost every day. And I still stay with a lot of plants and vegetables and have one big salad a day. Everyone out there should be cautious of simple carbohydrates, sugar, and alcohol. These things should be used minimally and tempered with a good balance if you are to use them at all. I'm grateful for my time as a vegan because it was catalytic to the greatest transformation of my life. I'm not angry at my teachers for suggesting that I become vegan. I'm eternally grateful for their teaching, and I feel like I saved my teeth in time. If I had stayed longer as a vegan, may, I may have damaged every tooth in my mouth. I'm also open to returning to veganism at a much later stage in my life. And I even, from time to time, will throw in a 40-day vegan practice. Last year in 2020, during the heart of the lockdowns, dealing with all the stress of what might happen next and all of the uncertainty, I leaned in on veganism to deepen my spiritual perception and to simplify my nutrition. I did 40 days in a row of a vegan diet just to see if it could seduce me again, and it did not. During 2021, I may try it again this summer for 30 or 40 days. I like to go back to these practices for simplicity and purity. One of the things I never do is I never discuss veganism with people that have fewer years of practice in the art than myself. And as a general rule, I do not have debates with people in any practice that they are not themselves more steeped in than I am. And I always surrender and listen to people with greater experience than me. There is a great flaw in my meat eating, which I have to balance out or temper. I need to find a way for the incongruence of not killing the animals that I eat. This is very disturbing to me. You see, as a kid, I worked on farms. I've skinned many, many animals, deer, sheep, and goats. And as a kid, I was fascinated by anatomy, fascia, peeling back the skin, dismembering the animal, cleaning the organs. Something feels really off about not killing the animals I eat. Even the chickens now, my partner and I have agreed to keep them as pets and use the eggs, but have agreed to not kill them. I hope to resolve this incongruence or perhaps I may part ways with eating meat if I can't bring myself to kill the animals I eat 
and embrace the karma that is attached to taking their lives. All in all, this time as a vegan provided a great inspiration for my mind to know that I can do anything I put my mind to. It provided the energy of devotion. It cultivated compassion that I never had at the level I possess now. And my senses stretched out beyond the ordinary five realms of perception. I'm grateful for veganism being so catalytic towards the greatest transformation of my life. I no longer believe that one has to be vegan to be spiritual or be a yogi. I think one can actually be more in tune with nature, the natural world, and the rhythmic cycles of the divine if one honors nature and eats what is right for one's body and one's health. So again, I'm super grateful. And anyone who wishes to do this experiment can also have the great gains and deeper understanding of themselves in the way that I did. But I'm happy for where I am today and having the sense of balance between plant-based and animal food. I also found peace with my brother's death. I believe veganism helped me to understand very complex ideas like karma, why one takes birth, and why one's time here is limited. It made me really appreciate the connection and the gift of my brother's life. Now that I look back through so much time having passed since his death, I can see that this is the reason why I became a yoga teacher. That burning question inside the back of my head to wonder where he might have gone or been. That question drove me to Jivamukti, New York City, and veganism helped me to commit to yoga to the point that I would have a deeper understanding of life, birth, and death, the cycle that we are all in. I remain eternally grateful for the work of Sharon Gannon. She was really the one, more so than David, that made me realize veganism could be helpful to my spiritual pursuits. She is the first woman that I met who truly mastered her mind and could create empires from just seeds of thought in her imagination. To watch her create the international Jiva Mukti Yoga method and impact so many lives in a positive way inspires my own generative effort. Something is being birthed inside of me that has to come out, and her work ethic, her devotion to human evolution inspires everything that I do. I believe we are always training to master our own mind. So when we go into any practice, as we show up every day, how we show up tells us so much about who we are that day and who we are becoming in the future. You see, by learning to lead ourselves first, we then become qualified to lead others. Thanks so much for tuning into the podcast today. I've really enjoyed sharing the story about my past, and I hope it inspires some of your adventures and your own experiments. You can train daily with me Monday through Friday in live yoga classes on Zoom. I teach five classes that you can learn more about on my website, jaisugram.com, J-A-I-S-U-G-R-I-M.com. Just click the classes tabs and you'll have an option to drop in or sign up for a membership. You can also support the podcast, show some love by going to my Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com backslash Jai Sugram, and become a contributor to have access to special classes, seminars, and talks that are exclusive to members. I really appreciate your love and support. Thank you and have a fantastic